All right, good afternoon, everyone. I've just seen that my clock has ticked over to 1 o'clock p.m., so we're going to go ahead uh, and begin with our program today. So, uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Andrew, and I am one of the planetarium educators at the Jennifer Chelsea Planetarium uh, at the Liberty Science Center. And while we can't be with you in the planetarium right now, uh, we're continuing to bring you some virtual programming through Facebook Live. Uh, this is, I think, our 18th planetarium online, if I'm not mistaken, uh, somewhere around there. Um, so today we're going to be talking all about dark matter and dark energy. But a couple things before we do begin with our program. Uh, it was just announced yesterday, or maybe early this morning, all, all the days are kind of kind of bleeding together at this point, that Liberty Science Center will be reopening to the public on Labor Day weekend. So we'll be open to our members on September 4th, and we'll be open to the general public starting on September 5th. So stay tuned to our Facebook page and all of our social media for more details on uh, brand new uh, brand new experiences and what we'll be doing to keep all of our guests and all of our staff safe uh, as we get ready to reopen uh, starting uh, Labor Day weekend. Um, again, if you have questions f f uh, during the program, you can write them in the comments. Uh, I'll be keeping my eye on them and we'll try to answer as many of them as possible. We also do have my colleague, Mike, who is in the chat, who will be answering your questions as well. Um, so uh, if you've got any questions about dark matter, dark energy, astronomy, you can let us know. And, uh, and um, while we are still closed, Liberty Science Center, we, we are still uh, uh, um, relying on, on your donations to allow us to continue to do programs like this. So, so if you're able to, and if you'd like to, uh, uh, you can make a donation to Liberty Science Center. There should be a, a, a donate button somewhere around my head, um, uh, and that's the best way that, that you can support us and will allow us to continue to bring you uh, Planetarium Online for the rest of July and the rest of August as well. But again, today we're going to be talking about dark matter and dark energy. So let's go ahead and uh, get started with our program. So when we look out into space, um, we see a lot of stuff, right? Um, if you've attended our programs before, we've talked about stars, galaxies, planets, exoplanets. We see so many things, right? We see thousands of stars with just our eyes. We're seeing now the huge Milky Way galaxy. We see things like planets, big nebulae. We can discover things like black holes. Beyond the Milky Way, we observe uh, a total of about 2 trillion galaxies in the universe. So it's safe to say that when we look out into space with our eyes or with our telescopes, there is a lot that we can see. But it turns out that the things you can see with your eyes or with telescopes or detect in any way with your eyes only makes up about 5% of the total amount of stuff in the universe. Visible matter, what we're going to call it today, or normal matter, you might hear it called before, only makes up 5% of the amount of mass energy, the amount of stuff in the universe. 5%. What about the other 95%? Well, we'll be talking about that other 95% during the course of the program today. About 26% of the rest of the universe is made up of dark matter. So the other 26%. The other uh, almost 69% uh, to be exact of the universe is made up of something called dark energy. So this is what the universe is made of, a combination of visible matter, which only makes up 5% of the mass of the universe, dark matter, just 26%, and dark energy, which is 69%. Today we'll be talking about most of, uh, most of the universe, uh, dark matter and dark energy. So to begin with, let's uh, start with talking about dark matter. That is the second uh, least common uh, uh, part of the universe. To understand dark matter, though, let's first begin uh, by talking a little bit about gravity. Gravity is key to understanding dark matter, and gravity is key to, well, all of us. Right here on the Earth, gravity holds us where we are. 
I'm not floating away into space right now because gravity is holding me down on the Earth. Throw a baseball up in the air and it comes down. We can thank gravity for that. Gravity, though, also holds all the water around the Earth. The oceans, the lakes, the rivers stays where it is thanks to gravity. The oxygen in the atmosphere and the atmosphere itself stays around the Earth thanks to gravity. So gravity is the force that kind of binds the Earth together and keeps it the way that it is, allowing us to breathe and giving us water to drink. Beyond the Earth, though, gravity also plays a very, very important role in the solar system. Gravity keeps the solar system together as well. It's why we have eight planets all orbiting around the sun. The force of gravity keeps all of these planets in, in their orbits. Without the sun, without the gravity from the sun, the solar system wouldn't exist. So gravity keeps the solar system together. Gravity also binds the Milky Way together. Right, The Milky Way is this big collection of about 200 billion stars and about 200 billion planets, all this gas and dust, so much stuff. It's all kept in this big disk, this big spiral shape, thanks to gravity. I think you're kind of getting the point now. Gravity is the force that really binds structures in the universe together. Gravity is also responsible for binding together the largest structures that exist in the entire universe. These are called galaxy clusters. So galaxy clusters are these huge groups of hundreds or even thousands of galaxies. They are all bound together by, you guessed it, gravity. Gravity keeps them together. Now, when we look at these galaxy clusters, though, and we study them very closely, we notice something very uh, peculiar about them. So these galaxy clusters, the galaxies in them, are all traveling. They're all kind of orbiting around the cluster, like the planets of the solar system orbit around the sun. Kind of a similar idea. And we can measure those velocities. We can also, based on what we see with our eyes, measure the amount of mass and thus the amount of gravity that we expect to be in these galaxy clusters. It turns out when we do that, there is not enough gravity to keep galaxy clusters together. Based on how quickly these galaxies are traveling, the velocity that they're traveling at, if the only gravity here was from stuff we could see, these galaxy clusters would completely fly apart. But they don't. Galaxies stay in these clusters. So this was a very, this is a very kind of confusing idea. If the only source of gravity came from something that we could see, came from things we could see, Galaxy clusters like this one, this is the coma cluster, would not exist. The galaxies in the cluster are just traveling far too quickly. There's not enough gravity based on what we see with our eyes to keep these clusters together. This was an idea and an observation that was first made back in the 1930s by an astronomer by the name of Fritz Zwicky. He, uh, uh, he, he was a Swiss astronomer back in the 1930s. He observed this coma cluster and made that observation. He figured out, or at least he had the idea, that for these galaxies to stay together, there had to be some other source of gravity, some other matter that he couldn't actually see. So he called that dark matter. That's where the idea of dark matter comes from. We know that there has to be more gravity in this cluster for, uh, for this cluster to exist uh, in the way that it does. Without, without this dark matter, the cluster wouldn't exist. And it was Fritz Zwicky that had the first idea for this. Now, I'm seeing a really, really great question uh, uh, from Derek about what causes gravity. That is a really good question. And... To be honest with you, astronomers and physicists don't fully understand what exactly causes gravity. We don't really know for sure. We know that gravity comes from anything that has mass. So you have mass, I have mass, the Earth has mass, the Sun has mass, these galaxies have mass, so they have gravity. That means that dark matter also has mass. 
but we can't actually see dark matter. So dark matter is this weird thing that exists. It has mass, it has gravity. We can know it's there, but we can't see it. Now, Fritz Zwicky, uh, Fritz Zwicky on his own with his measurements couldn't get uh, precise enough to actually confirm dark matter. He had really big uncertainties in his measurements, which is what happens when you were doing astronomy back in the 1930s. The telescopes just weren't quite there. Introduce everyone real quick to my cat. If you heard him in the background a moment ago, his name is New Cat, and he uh, wants to hang out for a little bit. Um, uh, and also is trying to destroy my computer. We're just going to set him down on the ground over here and keep him from doing that. So, Fritz Wicke couldn't confirm dark matter. He didn't have the precision in his instruments to be able to do it quite yet. So later on in the 1970s, there was another astronomer by the name of Vera Rubin. And she studied not galaxy clusters, but galaxies themselves. To be exact, Vera Rubin studied of galaxies. The rotation of the material, the gas, the stars in these galaxies. You can learn a lot about a galaxy based on how things rotate in it. Right? We think of the one of the ways that we can measure the mass of, of the thing is by watching how the planets orbit. And what, what she thought she was going to see in these galaxies when she measured rotations was a similar thing to what we see in the solar system. When we look at Mercury, Mercury travels a lot more quickly. It orbits the sun a lot more quickly compared to a planet like Mars or the Earth, which is further away. And especially faster than a planet like Uranus, which is creeping along way back here. So the closer that the planets are to the sun, the faster that they orbit. They're feeling the tug of the sun's gravity more, and that makes them move more quickly. When we look at a galaxy, we expect to find the exact same thing, right? Let's look back at the Andromeda galaxy here. Based on what we see, visible matter is mostly concentrated at the center of this galaxy, right? That's what this very bright spot is here. Most of the visible matter in this galaxy is concentrated at the center. So she expected to find that the closer you were to the galaxy, the faster you'd be rotating. The further you were from the center, the slower you'd be rotating. Let's kind of look at this in, in a bit of a bit of a model galaxy. Not any real galaxy, but just kind of a model galaxy. So we could define something like this, where the further you were from the center, the slower you would go. Make a lot of sense, right? That's where most of the gravity, most of the mass would be concentrated if all there was was visible, was visible matter. But as you might assume, that is not at all what she found. What she found was actually more like this, that it did not matter how <laughs> And it did not matter how far you were. That was New Cat knocking something off the table. He's okay, and so is the table, thankfully. Uh, he wanted to clear some space for himself. So what Vera Rubin actually found was something more like this, where it didn't really matter how far you were from the center of the galaxy. You rotated at about the same speed. It didn't really matter. That meant that there had to be more gravity, more matter, more mass spread throughout this galaxy that she couldn't see. We couldn't see. So Vera Rubin and her observations were the first really, really precise evidence that we had for dark matter. Again, we were observing that there had to be more gravity in this galaxy to cause everything to rotate at the same speed. Not only that, this, this mass, this gravity, had to be spread throughout the galaxy. This is what we think uh, kind of the picture of a galaxy would look like if we could actually see dark matter, which we can. But if we could see dark matter, it would look, uh, it would be spread out like this. All this blue we're seeing here, we're representing this as dark matter. Thanks to Vera Rubin's observations and, and, and other astronomers as well throughout the years, we are very, very sure that dark matter is spread all throughout the galaxy. 
and the mass and the gravity from the dark matter spread throughout keeps this galaxy rotating the way it does. It keeps the galaxy together. Without dark matter, galaxies would look and would be completely different. Now, there are a lot of things that keep galaxies. It's not just dark matter. Things like black holes help. But dark matter is the only way to explain this, this kind of weird and strange rotation that Vera Rubin saw. So, let me look through a few of our questions so far um, about, uh, about this so far. Let me see. So what is at the center of galaxies? And so the centers of galaxies have black holes at the exact, exact center. That's what's there. The rest of it is made up of stars and dark matter and gas and planets. Stuff like that. Um... So can galaxies collide? They absolutely can. And in fact, the Milky Way in about 4 billion years will collide with a different galaxy. Great, great questions. So again, if, if you have any questions at all, you can continue to write them into the comments section. Uh, so what are planets made of? How are planets made? Planets are made when um, chunks of rock, you can think of them kind of like asteroids, in the very, very early universe kind of came together. You can think of it almost like building, building a snowball almost. Planets would have began as a smaller kind of ball of rock. That ball of rock had gravity. The gravity from that ball of rock would have attracted more chunks of rock to it to form into planets. Gases, uh, gas giants were formed pretty much Pretty much the same way. Let's see. So Marcy asks a really, really good question. Is matter just made up of, 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 of atoms? So, so what we call visible matter is made up of protons, neutrons, electrons. Those are made up of other smaller things, uh, things like quarks and stuff like that. Dark matter, as far as we know, is not really made of protons, electrons, neutrons. We'll talk more about that in, in just a little bit. So, dark matter is key to how our galaxy is. But the effect and the impact of dark matter is actually way larger than just individual galaxies. Dark matter has helped to shape the entire universe. What we're about to see here is a simulation of how the very, very early universe formed. This is called this is called the Aquarius simulation. Everything you see here, all this pink and blue and uh, and kind of purple, is gas. The brighter something looks, the more gas that there is there. This simulation begins very early on in the universe. At this point, the universe was really just a whole bunch of gas randomly spread out through space. Galaxies and stars hadn't quite been able to form yet. So for a galaxy to form, it needs something to form around. I'll use the snowball analogy again. You need that initial little snowball to build the rest of it up. Galaxies need that same thing. And galaxies form around dark matter. This gas formed around dark matter. All of these bright areas we're seeing here are the formations of these new galaxies as they're being formed, and this gas collects around dark matter. Just see here, without it, galaxies wouldn't have had anything to form around. Near as we can tell, dark matter isn't really affected by the other forces that visible matter is. So dark matter could clump together first. Dark matter clumped together and then form galaxies and form stars clump together around this dark matter. So dark matter grouped together first and then visible matter grouped around it. It's safe to say that without dark matter, the universe would not be the same today. In fact, we wouldn't matter. That may sound like a crazy thing to say, 
But it's true. Without dark matter, the Milky Way would not have formed. It certainly wouldn't have formed by now, and it wouldn't have formed in the same way. But dark matter has led to the universe, these kind of stringy, like filament-looking structures, which is what we actually observe today. This Aquarius simulation, which assumes the presence of dark matter, matches up very, very closely with the actual universe that we observe. So dark matter is important to us. But what exactly is dark matter? Um, well, dark couple of very unique properties. Dark matter does not interact with light. That means light is straight through dark matter. Light doesn't bounce off or get absorbed. It passes right through it. Near as we can tell, dark matter is through any visible matter. The only way that dark matter interacts with regular matter is through gravity. But dark matter doesn't interact with, with regular matter in any other way, only through gravity. That means dark matter is really hard to study, right? We can't see it. It doesn't emit light. It doesn't interact with light. If a big chunk of dark matter was, was passing by you right now, it would pass right through you. You wouldn't even notice it. So what is dark matter? Well, we don't know. We know it exists, but we don't know what it is. Scientists, though, have some ideas, some, some hypotheses as to what dark matter could be. One idea is that dark matter could be something called a weakly interacting massive particle, or a WIMP. These are theoretical particles, we don't know if they exist, that would explain dark matter. It would be a particle that would be massive, but it would have gravity, but it would be weakly interacting with everything else. Again, we don't know if WIMPs are real, if these are real, but it's an idea that we have. One idea that's been largely disproven, but is my favorite idea, is that dark matter is just lots of little tiny black holes. We don't think that's what it is, but I wanted to put it in here because this is one of the earliest ideas we had as to what dark matter could be. In the process of trying to understand it, we had to rule out everything else. And at this point, the idea that it's lots of tiny black holes is pretty much been ruled out, unfortunately. It'd be cool if it was lots of tiny black holes, but um, here we are. Another option for what dark matter could be is something called a sterile neutrino. We know that neutrinos exist. They are created all the time. The sun creates some kinds of, of neutrinos during its process. We detect them. But dark matter could be something called a sterile neutrino. These would be a kind of neutrino we haven't discovered yet. A neutrino is kind of a fundamental particle, um, like a quark. Um, and a sterile neutrino would be a flavor of a neutrino that would have more mass, and that on top of that um, would interact even less with visible matter than other Another idea is that they could be something called an axion. This is another theoretical particle. You can tell that we really don't know. Three of the options that I've given are particles that we don't even know if they exist. These are all theories. These are all ideas as to what dark matter could be. We simply just don't know what dark matter is. We don't know. There are laboratories right now that are working on this project. We built a lab uh, uh, underneath the South Pole. So we, we built to try and understand what dark matter is. We, we've tried to do that. We still just don't know. But dark matter is key to the rest of the universe. It is important because without it, we would not exist. We wouldn't, they would not exist. Let's see. So that's dark matter. We're going to move on to dark energy in just a moment, but I want to check real quick, see what dark matter questions we have. 
So Christina wants to know, can dark matter go through glass? Can it go through the glass? It, yeah, dark matter will pass through anything, anything, which is kind of weird to think about. If a chunk of dark matter were floating by right now, it'd pass right through you. That's why we can't, that's why we don't know what it is, right? It doesn't interact with things like we would expect. Ah, so, 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 so that, that, that is a, that is a, a very important point to clarify. Um, we could observe its gravity. We could. If it was a big enough chunk of dark matter, we could observe its gravity, right? But we wouldn't feel anything else, just its gravity. That's a really, really great point. I didn't see who brought that up. But yeah, that's a very, very great point. Let's see. So, so how do black holes form? So black holes form when really, really big stars run out of fuel at the end of their lives. They collapse into black holes. That's where black holes come from. They come from really, really big stars. And, uh, and, and yeah, I'm seeing a lot of optimism in the comments right now. Ka especially is saying that we don't know what it is now, but we will someday. I agree with you. There are, uh, there are too many smart scientists out there, including many of you watching this right now, for us not to figure it out eventually, right? This is just kind of the process of science. Let's see, so how and why is the universe expanding that seems like a great question to transition to our discussion of dark energy. So, dark matter energy, even though they have a similar, have nothing to do with each other really at all. Kind of unfortunate that they have similar names, but dark matter and dark energy really have nothing in common at all. But before we talk about dark matter, let's talk about the universe a little bit, shall we? So the universe began about 13.9 billion years ago. It began, we think, in a process called the Big Bang. Since then, the universe has been expanding. That means that every galaxy in the universe for the most part, is getting further and further away from each other. So the universe is expanding. It has been for 13.9 billion years. But what is going to happen in the future? Will the universe keep expanding? Will it slow down? Or will the universe eventually come back together? The galaxies reverse and the universe contracts into what we would call the big crunch. We don't know for sure what's gonna happen yet, but we think they have a really, really good idea. For a long time, we thought the universe would eventually, at the very least, slow down in its expansion. Remember, about 30% of the universe is made up of visible matter and dark matter, things that have gravity. Gravity tries to pull things back together. So we thought for a while that the future of the universe would look maybe something like this, where the universe would expand for a while, but then it would collapse and crunch back together, what we would call the big crunch. So we thought for a while that the universe would be kind of like you going outside and throwing a baseball up into the air. We all know what happens when you throw a ball, this white uh, this white square is going to represent our baseball today. You throw that up into the air, it comes up, you've given it some initial, some initial velocity, some initial speed to it, it flies up into the air, and then eventually it will come back down. The gravity of the Earth brings that object back down. So we assume something similar would happen with the universe. All the gravity that's present in these galaxies from visible matter, from dark matter, would eventually bring everything back together. That's what we expected. What we observe, though, is literally the opposite of that. What we observe is more like if you took a baseball, you threw it up into the air, there's our baseball, and instead of coming back down to the Earth, it accelerated into space, getting faster and faster and faster. Imagine how strange that would be if you threw a baseball up, 
It didn't come down, but it actually accelerated faster and faster into space. We know today that the universe is not only going to expand forever, but the expansion of the universe is accelerating. It is getting faster. This was a discovery that was made um, uh, that, that, that was made back uh, back in the 1990s by a research group uh, that call themselves the High Z Supernova Search Team. Here they are pictured in, in, in Stockholm in December of 2011 after they won a Nobel Prize. On this team was friend of Liberty Science Center, Dr. Zha. You can see him pictured right here. Dr. Zha is a professor of astronomy at Rutgers. He's a great friend of Liberty Science Center. Uh, uh, he gave a talk in the planetarium uh, last year about this very same topic. They made this discovery that the universe was expanding and accelerating in its expansion by looking at supernova, supernovae. If, if you never heard of that word before, a supernova is a kind of explosion that happens to a star. Here is what a galaxy looks like before a supernova and then after a supernova. So this research team looked at these galaxies after they had had a supernova in them, and they could use this to measure the distance to these galaxies. To be exact, these researchers looked at a kind of supernova called a type 1a supernova, a type 1a supernova. That happens when a, when a, a kind of star called a white dwarf, you can see that picture right here, is surrounded by and orbited closely by another star. The white dwarf's gravity is so strong, and it comes up again for us, that it is pulling gas off of this companion star. It's growing and gaining mass. Eventually, it gains so much mass that this white dwarf completely explodes in what we call a type 1a supernova. These white dwarfs explode when their mass reaches exactly 1.4 times the mass of the sun. Because these explosions happen when these white dwarfs reach the same mass, we can use them as kind of a, kind of a measuring stick almost. When we observe one of these explosions that has happened, we know how bright it should be. That means by measuring how bright it looks, we know how far away it is. So by observing the supernova in these galaxies, we were able to measure the distances to them. So this was a huge discovery. When they observed these explosions, they realized that these galaxies were further away than they should have been. So there had to be some force in the universe causing them to speed up in their expansion away from us. That observation alone taught us that the universe is accelerating in its expansion. The expansion of the universe is accelerating. Why is that happening? Well, we have dark energy to thank for that. Dark energy is what's causing the universe to expand forever. Here's kind of a little toy model of what we mean by this. The galaxies in the universe are today expanding forever. But dark energy is a kind of force that works almost opposite to gravity that pushes galaxies apart. Gravity wants to pull them together, but dark energy pushes them apart. That means these galaxies are accelerating in its expansion, in their expansion. Space is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But what does this mean for us? What does this mean for the future of the universe? Well, it means that the universe will expand forever. Because the universe is expanding forever and it's accelerating in its expansion forever, that means eventually, trillions and trillions of years from now, the Milky Way galaxy will be the only galaxy we can see. Every other galaxy in the universe will be too far away from us to be able to see. 
The Milky Way galaxy will be the only galaxy we can see. We won't be able to see any other ones. Space will have expanded so much that every other galaxy in the universe will be out of our reach, out of our ability to see. And that's kind of a scary thought, right? But that's what's going to happen. And this is going to happen thanks to our good friend, dark energy. Dark energy. What exactly is it? Well, a lot like dark matter, we do not know. But we do know the properties of what, of, we do know the properties that, that dark energy actually has. We know that dark energy behaves kind of opposite to gravity, where it pushes things apart, pushes everything apart. So we know it behaves sort of opposite to gravity. But what, um, and we know that it's the reason why the universe's expansion is accelerating. Dark energy is what's causing that to happen. But what is, what is dark energy? What is it made of? What causes it? We, again, don't know. We think it could just be a fundamental energy or a property of space itself. One idea is that for every little bit of space that there is, there is just inherent energy to that, which is well, dark energy. Because we don't know what it is, we give it the name dark energy. So it could be maybe a fundamental energy, just a property of space. It could also be some kind of, of fifth fundamental force, like gravity is, right? We're always learning more. Maybe there's another force out there. Today, we know of four fundamental forces. We know of gravity. We know of the strong force. We know of the weak force. We know of the, of the electrostatic or the electromagnetic force. Maybe dark energy is some kind of mysterious fifth fundamental force. Or maybe we just don't understand gravity as well as we thought. Maybe we just don't understand gravity at all. Maybe we were wrong about the universe. That's always possible, right? That's part of being scientists is admitting maybe we were wrong. That's happened in astronomy forever, right? That's what's happened in every science forever. But at the end of the day, we don't know what dark energy is. These are three options as to what dark energy could be. But we do not know what dark energy is. We just simply don't. We know what it does. We are very confident it exists, but we don't know what it is. So dark matter and dark energy together make up most of the universe. And we don't know what either of those things are. It's kind of a weird mind bend, a weird mind twist for us. Because we just don't know what they are. They're important to us, obviously but we don't know what they are. They together make up 95% of the mass of the universe and we don't know what they are. But now that we've talked a bit about dark matter and dark energy, this was just kind of, kind of a, a big picture overview of what they are, what they do, how we know they exist. We are at the end of our program today. So if you've got questions and into the, into the comments, uh, I'll hang around for at least another five minutes or so to answer more of your questions. And I know dark matter and dark energy are two very confusing topics. They confuse me. I'm, I mean, I'm no dark matter, dark energy expert. I know a little bit, um, but they are very confusing topics because there's, there's so much we don't know. Now, we will be back here next Thursday at 1 o'clock p.m. for another Planetarium Online. Uh, Mike will be back talking with you about aliens, whether we think aliens exist, talking about how we're trying to find alien life and how our idea of aliens has changed throughout history. So tune in next Thursday at 1 p.m. while we talk uh, uh, while we talk about aliens. Again, if you want to uh, uh, support Liberty Science Center and the Planetarium and our uh, Planetarium online streams, uh, you can do that by donating to Liberty Science Center if you'd like to and if you're able to. There is a donate button uh, somewhere around the video. I haven't figured it out still over here to my right or to the left. It's somewhere or somewhere around me. 
But thank you so much for uh, tuning in today while we talk about most of the universe, dark matter, dark energy. I'm going to hang out, though, for another few minutes and answer more of your questions. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much. Um, so let's see what questions we have about dark energy. Oh, Tracy wants to know, would we exist without dark matter? That's a good question. Um, I would say no, because the universe wouldn't be anything like it is today. Dark matter helped galaxies form. Dark matter gave galaxies something to form and build around. So without dark matter, galaxies would have taken way longer to form than they actually did. So we probably wouldn't be here today. Maybe we would still be here, but three billion years from now without dark matter. But dark matter is really important to us. So Marcy wants to know how fast is the universe expanding? It all depends on our perspective, right? So you can think of the expansion kind of like, imagine if you drew a bunch of little dots on a balloon and you blew up the balloon. The stuff furthest outside is expanding faster than the stuff closer to the center. So the edge of the universe is expanding faster than the speed of light. It's expanding incredibly, incredibly quickly. Close to us though, the universe is expanding much more slowly. I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head, um, but um, the closer um, things are to us, the slower they seem to be expanding. That's just a matter of perspective. But the further something is, the faster it's expanding. The closer something is, the slower it's expanding away from us. That's why the Andromeda galaxy can collide with us, because it's close to us. That means the force of gravity can overpower this expansion force and bring our two galaxies together. Let me... Yes, yeah, so, uh, so uh, Terrell asks, is another explanation for dark energy associated with the Big Bang and the repulsive nature of gravity at distance less than the Planck length? Yes, yeah, that, that, is, that is one other, uh, one other explanation for it. You're, you're, definitely, you're definitely right. Another idea for dark energy, something I didn't really mention too much, um, was that it could be just kind of a property of quantum mechanics, that at really, really short, small distances, gravity behaves strangely. That kind of falls into our misunderstanding about gravity bullet point. But but yeah, it, it, it could be something to do with these sort of quantum mechanical effects. But we didn't get much into that today. But you're you're exactly right. That is one idea. Sylvia wants to know how many galaxies are there? Well, Sylvia, there are about two trillion. Maybe maybe a few more, maybe a few less, but somewhere around two trillion. And almost all of them are moving away from us, thanks to dark energy. And they're moving away from us more quickly. So, so, so Prasanna wants to know, would we feel it if dark matter passed through us? Um, no, unless there was a ton of it, then you'd feel its gravity. But by its very nature, dark matter doesn't interact with matter. So like if you if you clap your hands together, your hands interact. Your one hand stops your other hand. But dark matter doesn't have a force like that. It doesn't there's nothing to stop dark matter. It would just pass through you. If it, it if it had a lot of mass, um uh you could feel the gravity from it. It would pass right through you. So imagine if if you brought your hands together and just pass through each other. That'd be like if your hands were made of dark matter. I'm glad that they're not, but, you know. Uh, so, uh, so Vivek asks, is it possible that dark matter is just an unknown property of gravity? That is certainly a possibility. Um, we can study gravity pretty well um, by... 
um, by studying things close to us, we can study how gravity affects planets and things like that. It's certainly possible though, right? That is always an option in astronomy. It is always an option in science that the answer to something we observe is just, well, we didn't understand gravity very well, or well, we didn't understand how light works very well. So that's definitely a possibility. Um, it's always a possibility in science that the answer is, well, we learned something new, we were wrong, time to rethink. That's, that's what's so great about science. It's built into its very nature to always be learning more and changing how we think about things. Okay, so um, uh, uh, Mika Mega wants to know, how did things even start before the Big Bang? That is a question that I cannot answer. I have no idea. Nobody really does. In fact, we don't even know everything about the Big Bang. Um, we just don't know. Everything we understand about the universe comes from what we can see or what we can observe. And we can never observe anything, as far as we know, that happened before the Big Bang. That means we will really never be able to understand what happened before the Big Bang. We just don't know. We not a very satisfying answer, but we simply just do not know. Uh, it's one of those mysteries um, that hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll learn an answer to. Let's see. Ah, so, so one really, really great question. So are individual galaxies expanding and getting bigger because of dark energy? Um, so not really. Not, uh, not really. It's a great question, though. So in a, gra or in a galaxy, let me actually switch us over to a picture of a galaxy here. Over to our picture of a galaxy that's, that has dark matter in it. Technically, space is expanding in this galaxy, but, but the gravity inside of this galaxy uh, is keeping it together. So even though space is expanding by a little bit, a tiny, tiny, little, little bit, a small velocity, small force, the force of gravity is stronger than this expansion, and that is what keeps the galaxy together. So it keeps it from actually expanding. So it's, it's just like, um, it's like forces balancing out. It's the same way why the Andromeda galaxy will collide, even though space is expanding. So there is one part of the Andromeda galaxy's velocity that's moving away from us, but the part of its velocity from gravity is pushing it toward us, or I guess the part of the acceleration. And here my physics teacher, my physics professor's uh, 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 screaming right now, talking about velocity instead of acceleration, instead of forces. Let's see, so, uh, so Joey asks, is the gravity of our uh, of our galactic cluster strong enough to defy dark energy and stay together. So as far as we know, for the most part, yeah. So galaxy clusters are bound together enough by gravity that the expansion won't rip them apart, right? They're bound together enough by gravity. So at the very least, the local group of galaxies to us um, won't get ripped away because of the expansion. Um, so that's a very, very great question. Do so we have time for maybe one or two more as it is about 150? Man, time time flies when you're talking about dark matter and dark energy. That's that that's what I've learned today. So so many great questions. Let's see. Oh, Rachel asks a really, really great, it's a great question to end on. It's a really, really great question. Could it be possible that the universe is expanding due to gravity pulling on the universe from the outside? That is an idea that astronomers also have. Um, gravity is a very strange force. It's weaker than the other fundamental forces. One of the ideas for that is that maybe gravity is spread out throughout multiple universes or spread out throughout multiple things. 
So if there would be something outside of our universe, again, we don't know if there is, that could be a cause for it. It could be gravity pulling from outside the universe. But because that would be something outside the universe, it wouldn't be something we could ever really observe from inside of it. So we don't know. But that's a really, really great thought, a really great idea. The dark energy could be, again, just a misunderstanding about gravity, that there's stuff outside the universe that's pulling on us. We don't know. We just don't know. That's what makes dark matter and dark energy so exciting to talk about and why I've had such a good time being here with you all today. So before we end the stream, I just want to thank everyone one more time for joining me today. I had a lot of fun. I hope that you all did too. And we learned a little along the way. I know with dark matter and dark energy, there are usually more questions than answers. But again, that's science. Um, again, if you're, if you would like to, and if you are able to, to donate to us, there's a donate button, uh, 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 around here somewhere and Liberty Science Center will be reopening to our members on September 4th and reopening to the general public on September 5th. Stay tuned to our Facebook page, um, and our Facebook live streams, um, for more information about, uh, uh with some more details about that. But we'll be back here for another edition of Planetarium Online next Thursday at 1 o'clock. See you all then. Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your day.